Well, much to thank God for this week, as I mentioned in prayer, the trip to Springfield and the graduation of students there is a great encouragement because we see people getting excited about the truths of God's word and God's law as it applies to the civil body politic. And it's been an eventful week to say uh, the least. One of the blessings is to see how well Joe's campaign did. Um, very encouraging. And uh, a campaign that then bodes well for what awaits in November. Of course, we are praying as knowing Michael's campaign, the counting is still being done and we're praying for victory there. And though I did not prevail in my campaign, my campaign demonstrated, I think, something that is rather significant that the establishment Democrats do not speak for a significant portion of the people that they claim to lead. 35%, more than 35% actually, of those chose to vote for a pro-marriage, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, pro-smaller, less taxing government candidate is astonishing. Because my opponent in the paper, some paper said that he spent most of his time telling people that Whitney was not a Democrat and they shouldn't vote for him. It's kind of odd because more than a third of those people he tried to reach said, no, you're wrong, and we agree with him. So very interesting. I am not discouraged. Actually, I'm greatly encouraged by what I've seen. Now, that doesn't mean our work is done. It means that we see where we're at in a sense. When, like when you take a test at school, you try to measure where you are at in the progress you are making in a particular subject matter, well, I look at this as a measure that in that field, in, the, in, in that particular area of our county, we do have much work to do, but the message that we are proclaiming that God's law is supreme, that it is superior, beneath it is the U.S. Constitution, beneath that the state constitution, beneath that the county charter, and they are the supreme law of the land. That message is resonating with many voters. Many, many voters getting that message and it's gaining legs, not only here in our area, but it's gaining legs across the country as we saw uh, yesterday out in Ohio, where we see people there running for office, for local offices as well as for positions in the State House and even uh, Boehner in Washington, D.C. The district that is Boehner's is where we were yesterday. Boehner trembled and feared and had to pull all sorts of dirty tricks to win his primary because the message of God's law and the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution being supreme is gaining legs as we multiply thousands upon thousands of graduates from the teaching that we are offering. You see, Americans, I think, are beginning to wake up to the idea that the socialist lie that we have been sold is unsustainable. It's more money than we can possibly generate to sustain it. It is a freedom-killing agenda. It cannot last. And many Americans are realizing this, an increasing proportion of the population, even in what most people would characterize as a deeply blue state, one of the most blue states in the Union here in Maryland, that message is gaining legs, even in the party that is the bluest of the blue. God is good. We are encouraged by what we see taking place. Now, it's interesting, also in this campaign, it's been interesting to watch the attacks of the enemy that have come in floods in these campaigns. The slander and the lies and the vitriolic hatred, surprising in some, some regards but that is being spewed out both on the internet and robocalls and the newsprint. One article, for example, last week in the Baltimore Sun, cited as authoritative without any question whatsoever the reliability of their source of information. They cited the Southern Poverty Law Center and cited its attacks upon Michael and myself. Now, the specific Sun reporter writing that article, I had a conversation with her and warned her that the Southern Poverty Law Center was not to be trusted because, after all, it is linked in a federal court, and a federal court case has been linked with one of the few acts of domestic terrorism that has happened on our soil in the past 10 years. So here's an organization connected with domestic terrorism, and not my opinion, that's a federal court that has determined that, and I told her about the case, and 
uh, the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C., an individual inspired by the Southern Poverty Law Center, went in with 100 rounds of ammunition, intending to kill as many people as he could, and he had a pack of Chick-fil-A sandwiches, which he was going to smear in the dead faces of his victims. And he did this inspired by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and he said so in a court of law. And I told this reporter that if she did not report that the Southern Poverty Law Center was not to be trusted for that reason, as a questionable source, and that the FBI has recently dropped the Southern Poverty Law Center as a source of information about uh, dangerous people within our borders, that she completely lacked journalistic integrity. And you can read the article and see the result for yourself. None of that is mentioned whatsoever. And so I sent her an email reminding her that her journalistic integrity has just been toasted. Now, these attacks that have come upon us really should not come as any surprise. No surprise to us, or whatever, because the more that we succeed, the further we gain ground in our land, the message of God's law as the supreme law of the universe, the more the God-haters will spew forth their hatred against the messengers. And it's interesting, it's not the message they're attacking as much as the messengers that they are attacking. You know what? That puts us in very good company. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to Acts chapter 4 as we continue in our story of Peter and John and the follow-up to the healing that took place there. Uh, by God's power, they healed that lame man at the, the gate of the temple. And the follow-up to that is very interesting to see because the attacks immediately came upon them as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 the arrest of Peter and John. And as they spake, Peter and John, as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in the hole unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Albeit, many of them which heard the word believed and the number of the men was about 5,000. Look at what, what had happened right here. Consider what had just taken place. Peter and John had been used of God to perform an amazing miracle on a man who was born lame and was over 40 years old, and they completely healed him instantaneously in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the political leaders of Jerusalem were not happy about this miracle, to put it mildly. The text here tells us they were grieved and that word grieved in the original language is even much stronger than our English word grieved. It has the sense of somebody working hard and somebody toiling uh, and somebody doing something that involves a great deal of pain on their part, accomplishing with uh, great labor. And it, it, it has the sense of somebody being extremely displeased and offended, somebody being pained, somebody being all worked up about what has just taken place. And so the political leaders of Jerusalem were in a ladder. They were in a frenzy in their hatred and their anger for not just the miracle, but the message connected with the miracle that Peter and John were proclaiming there in the temple of Jerusalem. They were grieved. They were troubled. And consider this. Pagans. Pagans are greatly disturbed by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that just didn't happen 2,000 years ago in their day. That happens today as well. Pagans are greatly disturbed by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it doesn't bother them if you teach children Buddhism and tell them that Buddhism is true. Or if you teach them Hinduism, here's 300 million idols that you can worship as a Hindu. Or if you teach them Mohammedanism and you teach them the prayers out of the book of the Koran and so on. No, that doesn't bother them at all. Oh, would you dare teach children the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and they have a hissy fit. They get very upset. They become very angry. What's going on? Think of it for a moment. If they were consistent with their own purported belief system, what they say they believe, they would believe all these belief systems, Christianity being one of them, but they're all equal. And therefore, none of them should receive any special attention. None of them should receive any singling out with contrast to any other belief system whatsoever. But do you notice that that is never the case? That's never the case. Instead, Christianity is always singled out. Christianity is always treated unequally in contrast with the other belief system. 
friend of mine some years ago was a teacher in the public school system over in Howard County, and he decided to do an experiment one day. He took two books, and he put them on his desk, the front edge of his desk as a teacher. One book was the Bible. That's right, he put the Bible on his desk as a teacher. The other book on the other side of his desk was the Koran. So he had a Bible and a Koran on his desk as a teacher. When the principal found out about this, he got very upset and came in and told him, you can't do that. You've got to get rid of that Bible. And the teacher said, wait a minute, let me understand this. It's okay for the Koran to remain on my desk? And the principal said, yes, but the Bible has to go. And he said, why? Well, separation of church and state. Well, wait a minute, separation of church and state. If you're going to treat all uh, belief systems equally, then why does the Koran get to stay but the Bible? And the principal wouldn't answer his argument. He said, no, no, the Bible has to go. And that teacher told me that he was so upset by that that after he finished that year, he quit. He quit teaching. He just could not stand the hypocrisy to say, we're going to treat Christianity unfavorably in contrast with all the other belief systems. Why is that? They cannot even be consistent with their own ideology. It's that way because we are actually engaged in a spiritual battle. It's not just a battle of setting out some ideas and some philosophies of life. It is a spiritual battle that we are engaged in. And because Christianity is the truth, when it is presented, then it is attacked by the enemy of the truth. That is by Satan and all of his minions. We look at what happens here. They're just preaching Jesus Christ. They're presenting the truth of the gospel. And the authorities show up and arrest them and put them in the dungeon. Wait a minute. There's no tolerance in that, is there? Think about the tolerance crowd today that's out there preaching tolerance. We're going to be tolerant, tolerant. They preach to us Christians. You're not tolerant enough. Or you're not tolerant at all. Well, it turns out this tolerance crowd has no tolerance for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's apparent all around us. When you declare God's truth given to us here in His Word, the tolerance crowd says, you can't do that. We will not allow that. That is not permissible. They're not tolerant at all, it turns out. This week, for example, I was accosted for the stands that I have taken in my campaign, pro-marriage, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, pro-smaller, less taxing government, those stands that I've clearly, I didn't admit it. Some people said I have some agenda. No, no, it's right there. I'll tell you exactly what it's about. Nothing hidden. You all know about it. The people all over the county know about it. One voter very upset with me said, you don't belong in the Democratic Party. I think it's wrong for you to be in the Democratic Party. I was like, well, sorry you feel that way. And I wasn't quick enough in my response, but in, in hindsight, what I wish I had said is this. Well, wait a minute. I thought you believed in diversity. That's right. If you believed in diversity, what's the problem here? How can you reject my views if there are no absolutes? How can you reject diversity when you say you want to be diverse? I can only imagine what the response would have been, uh, what they might say. They might say, well, you're too diverse for us. Well, then, yes, your mantra of diversity really isn't true after all, is it, you know? They really don't fully believe in their own propaganda that they put forth. You see, what's really going on behind the scenes, which is why they're, they have these inconsistencies, what's really happening is a spiritual battle is taking place. Those who serve Satan cannot help themselves. They have a visceral response and hatred towards the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and to anything that comes out of the Bible. And so when we share it, God's word says that, you know, citizens have a right to defend themselves. The Second Amendment is based on God's word and it's true. Oh, they have a visceral response to that. They hate that. Why? Because we're in a spiritual battle. Not just a matter of intolerance on their part. Look at what happens here in Acts 4. When those servants of Satan have political power, look out. What is the first thing they do with that political power? They persecute the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They throw them in prison and arrest them and tend to do them harm. You see, when we present the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of God's word, and they find that it is too powerful. The message is too powerful. That's why I say I'm encouraged by the response of my campaign because 
that many people responded to a message that they were told was evil, they were told it was not a democratic value, and that I was wrong for holding these views, they responded anyway because it has the ring of the truth. The Second Amendment is true, pro-life is true, pro-marriage, and it rang true with people because it is the truth. But when we present the truth and they find that they cannot deny the truth, they cannot throw enough propaganda and mud and cover up the truth, what do they do? Well, they do the only thing they can do. They then begin to persecute the truth and those messengers of the truth. They cannot stand to have the truth publicly proclaimed. And that is why they put Peter and John in prison. It's like, we're not going to allow these guys to preach. And the only way we're going to stop them immediately is throw them in the dungeon. They arrested them and threw them in jail. Now think of this for a moment. These are the civil authorities. These are the governmental authorities there in Jerusalem. What legitimate grounds did they have for arresting Peter and John? Were Peter and John violating the laws of nature and nature's God in any way, shape, or form? Were they violating the God-given rights of any individual or any group of individuals there in Jerusalem or in the temple? Were they violating the God-given right to life? Were they violating the God-given right to liberty or God-given right to property? Why this arrest? What, had they, what crime had they committed? Well, we see what happens. Followers of Satan, who when they possess power, are going to use that power corruptly and unjustly as they did here. These who had usurped the proper role of civil government then quickly become tyrants. And that's what those people were there in Jerusalem. They were tyrants. And the truth is that whenever civil government steps out of its God-ordained boundaries that are fixed here in God's law, whenever it steps outside of God-ordained boundaries, that civil government will abuse its powers and it will cease to be a legitimate government. It will become a tyrannical regime and ultimately it will inevitably begin persecuting the very people that God has charged them with protecting. So instead of protecting the people's God-given right to life, liberty, and property, it will attack the very people that God has ordained human civil government to protect. What reason could there possibly be for arresting Peter and John? They healed a man? Arrested for that? That's a crime, right? Oh, they preached in the name of Jesus? Oh, arrested for that? That's a crime. They tried to invent a new law that said it was a crime to do what Peter and John had done. And the arrest, therefore, was not lawful at all. In fact, if we look at what God's law says about the actions of these uh, leaders, these rulers in Jerusalem, what they engage themselves is an unlawful arrest, and an unlawful arrest is nothing short of kidnapping. That's right. You violated the God-given right to liberty of an individual, and you put them in bonds unjustly. That is kidnapping. If you study God's law, you see the penalty for kidnapping is a capital crime. It's a serious business. And so it's interesting to look at this passage and see the very first persecution this is the very first persecution recorded in God's word of the first Christian believers there in Jerusalem. They were disciples of Jesus Christ and they were persecuted over the issue of healing a man. They healed a man and for that and preaching the gospel, they were persecuted. And so the issue of health care and the proclamation of the gospel together was the cause of the first persecution of the first Christians in Acts chapter 4. Essentially, the rulers in Jerusalem were declaring that you cannot combine health care and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christianity. You can't put those two things together. So we see in this incident what happens when healing someone becomes a crime. Essentially, what the leaders did is they made up a new law and said, healing someone is now a crime. We're going to put you in prison for that crime. Hmm. That sort of reminds us of what has happened for doctors in our country today. If you know the details of it, Obamacare has criminalized healing someone in the name of Jesus Christ. One analyst looking at Obamacare, the bill itself says for the first time in history, the federal government now has control over how doctors can treat privately insured individuals. Most citizens already have health care insurance and they think, well, Obamacare won't affect me because I, it, 
I'm, I'm not in that system. I'm in a, in a private insurance system. Unfortunately, that's not true. Obamacare dictates the care of everyone, including those privately insured. Doctors will no longer be able to make decisions based on their patients' best interest. Under Obamacare, doctors will be forced to provide only the care that is approved by the government. That covers everything in medicine, whether your doctor give you a cardiac bypass or not, a stent, or whether your doctor can perform a C-section or give you a, a knee replacement surgery. All of those things are no longer the decision of the doctor to say, this is the best health care uh, that you as my patient need. Now, it's some beanhead bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. that makes that decision for you. And the system is set such that if the doctor does not do what the government is telling him to do. So they say, you can't do this procedure on this individual. They say, well, if you pay me the proper amount, I will replace your knee. I'll do that knee surgery for you. The doctor is now threatened as a criminal with having committed the crime of caring for someone's health. That's right. Those are the details of Obamacare. In fact, not only will he be fined for each individual action that he violates the, quote unquote, violates the Obamacare, he will also potentially be put out of business entirely, unable to do anything in the medical field. You see, today, healing has become a crime under our evil federal government. And if the doctor does not adhere to the guidelines set by the Human Health and Services Secretary, they'll be penalized and they will lose their ability to practice medicine in our land. It's astonishing. How in the world could you trust that your doctor is going to make a decision in your best interest when he's being threatened that he's going to be uh, charged and penalized and made a criminal if he doesn't do what the government tells, some beanhead bureaucrat tells him to do instead of what he knows as a medical specialist, what is in your best interest for your health? <laughs> Healing has become a crime. Dr. Emanuel, who's brother of Ram Emanuel, states this. When implemented, the complete lives system, and that's what they're calling this, the complete lives system produces a priority curve on which individuals aged between roughly 15 and 40 years get most substantial chance, whereas the youngest and oldest people get chances that are attenuated. Fancy language for saying, we're going to ration health care, and if you're beyond the age of 40, you get very little. And younger than the age of 15, you get very, very little as well. Dr. Emanuel admits that his plan appears to discriminate against older people. And he explains that by saying this, and I quote him, unlike allocation by sex or race, allocation by age is not invidious discrimination. Treating 65-year-olds differently because of stereotypes or falsehoods would be ageist. Treating them differently because they have already had more life years is not. And I end my quote of his evil right there. One would think a person with such dangerous and evil ideas would have no position of power whatsoever in America's health care system. Unfortunately, under Obamacare, this Dr. Emanuel has tremendous control over the rationing of the health care. He holds two official positions. One is the health policy advisor of the Office of Management and Budget, and secondly, as a member of the Federal Coordinating Council for Competitive Effectiveness Research. Both of these gives him absolute say over what you can and cannot have done to you at what age. This is the opposite of health care, my friends. It's not health care at all. Government health care actually is an oxymoron by definition because God's law, the only true law in the universe, God's law says human civil government has no jurisdiction whatsoever over the health care of any human being and health care, therefore, when the government takes a hold of it as they did in 65 with Medicare and Medicaid and now with Obamacare is completely in violation of God's holy law. So for the, for that's the first reason why government health care is an oxymoron. Second reason is government doesn't care. Does Dr. Emanuel care whether you live or die? No. He cares not one bit once you're over the age of 40. You see, it, he cannot care because he has no living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that health care was begun by Christians in obedience to their master, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, love your neighbor as yourself? That's the basis of our medical system. That's where it began historically. You see, when the ancient culture of Rome, they didn't bother with abortion, but if a baby was born that they didn't want, they just took it out to the 
the garbage dump. That's right. And I'd set that baby on the edge of the garbage dump, knowing that the ravaging critters at that garbage dump would soon consume that baby alive. When the ancient cultures were leaving their children to die of exposure, Christians went to the garbage dump on a daily basis and took up those babies and adopted them as their own and raised them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Christians are the ones who cared for the sick and even cared for the dying when the dying had things like the bubonic plague. Christians are the ones who built the first hospitals to care for the sick. They established centers of learning so people could uh, understand disease, what they are now called universities. It was Christians who outlawed the practice of the Hindus that threw the widow on the funeral pyre to burn alive on the pyre of her husband. It is Christians who, in obedience to their Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and not government, that truly cares for the health of people in our land. Today, under Obamacare, Healing has become a crime just as it was there in Jerusalem. They healed this man. And the authorities were very, very upset. Look at verse 4 for a moment. Actually, back to the Acts 4.4. 4, and notice this. The church grows in spite of the persecution against it. The church grew phenomenally in spite of the persecution. And I know that there are many today in the circles of evangelicals who are afraid that if we stand apart from our culture, if we proclaim the whole truth of God's word, and particularly where God's law speaks to every aspect of life in this culture, they're afraid that we are going to offend people. And I've certainly been told that multiple times in this campaign. I've offended people by things that I have said and things that I have proclaimed and messages that I have preached. I've offended people. And if I offend people, then they're going to be turned off to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They won't come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're told by these apologists for uh, the culture, essentially, oh, you need to tone down your message. That's right. You need to avoid stating God's truth as plainly as you do. Specifically, avoid stating God's truth in those areas where your culture would vociferously disagree with you and basically disagree with God's law on those particular matters. Where your culture will begin to call you names, call you intolerant, call you bigot, call you homophobe, or whatever it might be that they call. And they tell us that if you want the gospel of Jesus Christ to be attractive to the current generation, then we need to do, avoid doing anything that could be controversial, anything that would point out the popular sins of our day, anything essentially that would be bring conviction into the heart of guilty sinners. But what do we see the early church doing here in Acts chapter 4? Very clearly, they did the opposite. They boldly proclaimed the whole counsel of God, and they preached in order to convict men of their sins. They spoke the truth of God's law as absolute truth by which all human, uh, humans will ultimately be judged by this standard. They understood God's law will convict sinners. They'll convict sinners of their lost state and their need for a Savior. And therefore, they were unashamed, unabashed, and unapologetic about preaching all of God's law. This is what the early church did. They preached, and the lost, look at them, and thousands came to faith in Jesus Christ. And by the thousands, they were baptized. Just for a moment, glance back at chapter 2 and verse 41. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, you see there that uh, uh, 3,000 converts to Christ on the day of Pentecost. And here on, in chapter 4, at verse 4, we see on this day of preaching, a minimum of 2,000 men had to come to Christ. It had to probably be larger than 2,000 men because they're not even counting women and children at this point. That The numbers are getting so big they can't count them all and say, well, there was, you know, at least the, the number of disciples now is at least 5,000. It was probably larger than that by far on this day of preaching. Peter is an example to you and I in our day of preaching the whole counsel of God, of preaching the law of God, of preaching of the necessity of repentance and conversion to faith in Jesus Christ. And Peter and John were arrested and thrown into the dungeon for doing this. Now let's look at what happens next here in Acts 4. Look at verse 5 and follow. They were put on trial for this healing. And it came to pass on the morrow 
that their rulers and the elders and the scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had sent them, as Peter and John, sent them in the midst, they asked, by what power? You might actually say they are asked also, by what authority? By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole, notice what he's saying there, if we're being put on trial for health care, yes, this man's healed, you can't deny this man's healed, we're being put on trial, and indeed, he's stating the case, you're putting us on, on trial here of the crime of healing this man, okay, if we're being put on trial for this, then Peter continues, if they were being examined for this good deed done, to the intimate man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you, and to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set of naught by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Wow. Peter is bold. He doesn't hold anything back with these authorities there in Jerusalem who might have expected Peter to be rather fearful that they would crucify him next after Jesus. After all, they worked to get Jesus crucified and they succeeded as the same gang of uh, criminals that accomplished Jesus' murder. Now they got Peter in front of them in another kangaroo court trial. And they would figure Peter would be afraid of them. Peter's as bold as a lion. He's not afraid, which tells you the difference that the day Pentecost made. Before Pentecost, Peter is fearful and cowering and hiding and, uh, you know, fearful for being crucified. After Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, he's bold as a lion. He boldly proclaims the word of God to these uh, wicked authorities there in Jerusalem. This group would have included not only the current high priest, but the previous high priest and several high priests back, and, and then all the relatives and relations and the political hangers on to the high priest because the high priest is the one who had the greatest political power in Jerusalem. This is the political power elite of Jerusalem. And they held not only the spiritual power in the city, but the temporal power as well. They were the political as well as the religious uh, leaders. They are what is referred to as the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy that met that day. But just because they held positions of power did not make their actions lawful. And Peter is not at all shy to point this out to them. These were those who had unjustly condemned Jesus to death. And notice what Peter said, you're the ones that crucified him. He didn't say, Pilate crucified. No, you're the ones. You're guilty. His blood is on your hands. And Peter, they, I'm sure, wanted to threaten him as they do a little bit later, that uh, they would do the same to him. But they had one problem. They had a political problem. The crowd at this point in the city of Jerusalem was all on the side of Peter and John. They all saw this miracle. They heard the, the preaching. Peter and John were popular. So the politicians had a problem. Oh, if we deal with this guy like we want to deal with him, we're going to lose in the eyes of the crowd. We cannot afford to do that politically. So they were really making a political decision to allow Peter and John to live here rather than to be crucified. And pretty certain they could have pulled that off had they wanted to. The only reason Peter and John came out of this arrest alive was that the crowd was on their side at this point. They were brought before these rulers who formed this kangaroo court to decide their fate. And Peter and John are completely unconcerned about what might happen to them as a result of this trial. They are bold. And they preached Jesus to the authorities. These authorities don't want to hear it. You murdered the Lord Jesus. Mincing, mincing no words. These political leaders were the ones who killed Jesus. But God raised him from the dead. You murdered the Son of God. God raised him from the dead. You rejected him. Here he goes to prophetic scripture about the stone which the builders rejected. And Peter says, you are the fulfillment of that prophecy. That there's going to be a stone that God's going to ultimately build his kingdom upon. And you, the builders, rejected that stone. You have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. 
you evil builders. Wow. You couldn't get a more condemning message that could be preached to these individuals. Peter was not about to give them a, a lily livered gospel that had no punch in it whatsoever. He was going to tell them their sins straight up to their face without anything held back. And then finally closing his message that salvation is only possible in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That there's no amount of piety. And there was many in that group of 70 that believe their piety and their religiosity were going to earn them salvation in heaven. No amount of piety, no amount of good deeds could save you. Obviously, he was also saying that if you turn to false idols as all the world had, that those idols could never save you. That Jesus is the exclusive door to heaven. There is no other means of salvation. No other name. Buddha will not save you. Muhammad will not save you. The Hindu three million idols, they will not save you. The Mormon false Jesus will not save you. None of them will save you. Only the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, only salvation in His name alone. Now the interesting thing is these rulers would have had a lot in common theologically and philosophically with Peter and John. They would have believed there is one God, the God who created the whole universe. They would have believed that the 39 books of the Old Testament are our God's word. They would have agreed on a lot of things. Oh, but they certainly did not agree upon this, that Jesus Christ alone was the means of salvation. Peter was offering them a pardon for their terrible crime of crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, of murdering them. And they rejected that pardon that was offered to them. Back in 1830, George Wilson was convicted of robbing the U.S. mail, and he was sentenced to hanging for his crime. President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon for Wilson in his crime. The interesting thing is, when the pardon was brought to Wilson in prison, he refused it. He refused to accept the pardon. And so there was a debate, well, should he be hung? Or should the pardon's been issued, it's all paper, and what do we do? And so ultimately, the matter went up to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall, who concluded that Wilson would have to be executed. And he said this, a pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged, and so he was. The Lord Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, has offered pardon to every sinner in this world, to every human being. But that pardon has to be received. It's re if it's rejected, as it was by the Sanhedrin on that day, if it is rejected, it's not effective. They will not be saved. There is no way to be saved. Now the Sanhedrin faced, faced a big problem with their decision. Let's see what they did with it. Notice verse 13 and following, Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against him. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, What should we do with these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name, that is in the name of Jesus. Notice their evaluation of Peter and John. They kind of looked down their academic noses at Peter and John. Oh, they hadn't been to a proper prep school. Oh, they hadn't been to the best university. They obviously hadn't been to graduate school. They didn't go to medical school. They looked down and said, these people have no academic credentials, and therefore they despise them. But notice, they did pick up on one thing about Peter and John. They made one very cogent observation that Peter and John had been with Jesus. In other words, they could see Jesus shining through the lives of Peter and John. That Jesus not only had rubbed off on Peter and John and affected them, but rather Jesus had profoundly changed Peter and John from the inside out. Now that the Holy Spirit was indwelling them, this was patently obvious to these enemies of the cross, these enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is for you and I as well. The more time we spend with our master in prayer, the more time we spend with our master in his word, the more we come to reflect him in this culture, in this world. They say you can tell a lot about a person by the company they keep. And that is very true. And the more time we spend with the master as his disciples, the more the world will see that we reflect.
reflect Jesus Christ, even if they hate what we stand for, even if they hate the message, even if they want to kill us, which is what the Sanhedrin wanted to do, Peter and John here, they wanted to kill him. But they had to admit, those people have been with Jesus. Now look at the thorny problem that the Sanhedrin had. They had facts that they could not deny, that they could not cover up. Everybody in the city of Jerusalem knew about this healing. You recall that the man had been daily placed in the, the prime gate coming into the temple, the, the gate beautiful, and everybody that went to the temple to worship passed this man, this man asked alms from almost everybody in Jerusalem. They all knew him. They all knew that he was lame from birth. For more than 40 years he was lame. No doubt about that. And now he's walking. They could not deny the facts right there plainly in front of them. You know, I think it indicates that they would have liked to have denied the facts. If that was an option, they would have liked to put out propaganda. This man wasn't born lame. This was a fake. This was his double. He looks like it, but he's not the same man. We have the man that's lame. Here he is. Look, here he is. We got him. We can prove it. They would have liked to put out a propaganda campaign that said, Peter and John did no such thing. It's all a lie. Don't believe it. But they saw it was impossible to cover up the facts. The power of Christ in the life and the work of Peter and John was so powerful, they could not deny it. And I think there's a lesson here for us as well. God could call us to heal someone. That might happen. But whatever God calls and works for us, if we are filled with the Spirit, if we are rubbing off from God's Word, Jesus, and reflecting in the culture, there's going to be things that the world cannot deny. They may hear all kinds of propaganda against us, but then they look at it and say, wait a minute, you really, you actually make sense. You've got some truth there. I cannot deny that truth. The truth will always win, ultimately. Satan always tries propaganda first. To lie to cover up the truth. And when his propaganda campaign fails, then he turns to the next tactic. You see what it is there? Look at the next tactic. They're going to use the tools of Satan of threats and intimidation. They figure if they threaten Peter and John with death, if they intimidate Peter and John enough, they'll shut up and stop talking about Jesus Christ. I love what I've shared with the children there. The psalmist says in Psalm 37, basically his message is when you're threatened by the enemy, do not fret do not fear. Do not be intimidated. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Watch the grass be mowed. How easy it is for that blade to pass over the grass and chop it down. God's word says the evil who oppose the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hate the Lord Jesus Christ, they will soon be cut down like grass. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. We need to continue and move forward in proclaiming the good news. And they found no other path other than threatening the disciples and seeking to intimidate them. And so they let them go. Look at verse 18. Uh, Acts 4. Verse 18. And they called them, Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all or, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, so that when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And, it being, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests of the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Notice what they say right back to those who are commanding them to disobey the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said, go make disciples, go proclaim the good news. These men are saying, no, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. What was their answer? Which is the law? Is the law what you authorities say the law is? Or is the law what our Lord Jesus Christ says the law is? They put the question right back to them. Who should we obey? Should we obey God or should we obey you, so-called authorities who claim to be above God? You notice the implication of their statement there? Are you claiming to be above God? Are you claiming that your law is higher than God's law and we ought to disobey God's law in order to obey your law? That's the dilemma that the apostles put before these wicked rulers. What is 
right in God's eyes is not man-made law. What is right in God's, law, God's eyes is always God's law. Notice how clearly the disciples understood that distinction. God's law is supreme in how much? Just how to get to heaven? No, God's law is supreme in everything, in every area of life. Man's law must always be evaluated by God's law to determine whether it is legitimate or illegitimate. And if man's law is out of alignment with God's law, it cannot now ever or ever be law. Therefore, it is not to be obeyed. The apostles make no promise to obey unlaw. They say, this is not law. We will not obey. Notice their boldness to these supposed authorities. Whether it be right in the sight of God, hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. They were warning them that God is the ultimate judge and God's law is going to be used to judge you. They were directing them to look at God's judgment regarding the things that they were commanding Peter and John to do. And they didn't stop there. They came to a clear conclusion. They said, we will not. We will not stop proclaiming Jesus. We will not stop healing people in the name of Jesus. You can threaten us all you want. You can put us in prison. You can torture us. You can kill us. But nothing will stop us from obeying our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Nothing. Wow. That's the kind of holy boldness we need today in our land. When they command us, wicked officials command us to violate God's law. And you might say, well, David, nobody's telling Christians to disobey God's law today. That's not happening in America. No. Well, I beg to differ. How about the clerks of the county courts in this state of Maryland who are being commanded by wicked officials to issue marriage license to sodomites? That's a direct violation of God's law. Yet I know people who are Christians, quote, unquote, know how good Christians they are, that are doing this in our own county. The clerk of this county claims to be a Christian. I've met with him. And his assistant claims to be a Christian. I used to go to church with him years ago. And yet they're violating God's law because the authorities tell them to violate God's law. When a Christian is commanded to disobey God's law, they are not to do so. When Christians are commanded not to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in public schools, they got to do something. They should get out of public schools. Like my friend who was the teacher realized, look, if I can't even put the Bible and the Quran on the table, forget it. This thing is not about any honesty or truth. When Christians are commanded not to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ at work or in the military or anywhere in society, they must obey God's law and not man's supposed commands. See, there's an increasing number of situations as persecution moves forward in our land. Increasing amount of situations where Christians are going to be faced with these difficult decisions. And some Christians are taking the stand of Peter and John today. But we need all those who are followers of Jesus Christ to take that same stand, to say God's law is supreme in everything and man's law must always be evaluated by God's law to determine if it is legitimate and if it's out of alignment with God's law, it is not binding on us. It cannot now or ever be law and therefore it is not to be obeyed. We need to be willing to say with Peter and John, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye. We will not stop proclaiming Jesus Christ. We will not stop healing in his name. You can threaten us all you want. You can put us in prison. You can torture us and even kill us. And nothing will stop us from proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. You know, in ancient Rome, how this developed. Crowds by the tens of thousands showed up at the Colosseum to watch Christians being torn apart by wild animals. Because Christians refused to submit to man's authority, supposed authority, in disobedience with God's commands. Paul Radio, years ago, commented on his visit to the Colosseum there in Rome. He said, I stood uncovered to the heavens above, where he sits for whom they gladly die. And I asked myself, would I, could I die for him tonight to get this gospel to the ends of the earth? Raider said he continued to pray fervently that in that Roman arena, the spirit of the martyr would come upon him. But working with the Holy Spirit in my heart as he worked in Paul's heart when he brought him handcuffed to Rome. Those early Christians lived on the threshold of heaven. They were within a heartbeat of home and nothing in this world could hold them back from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, that day in the life of Peter and John was not the day of their martyrdom. For Peter, it was many years later. And for John, the account of his suffering that didn't lead to his death is recorded at the very end of the Bible. And it tells us here, being let go, what did they do? They went back to their church. They went back to their fellowship, their company, reported all that the chief priests and elders said. And when they heard it, what was the response? They began praying. That's right. Look at this prayer for just a, a brief moment. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Because you're God, you're the sovereign Lord over everything. Your law alone is law. Who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain, the vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And they're recognizing what they just experienced was a fulfillment of this prophecy given in the Psalms by David. For of truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Where they assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. God answered their prayer. But notice their response to persecution. They begin praising God. They begin worshiping God for his greatness because they're being persecuted. That should be our response to persecution. In fact, praise puts it all into perspective. If you realize and think about and meditate on who God is, on his greatness as the creator of all things, as the ruler of the universe, yes, we may suffer in this world, but we know that we are on the side of the victors. Praising and worshiping the one true God puts everything else into perspective because we focus on who God is, extolling his greatness, extolling his sovereign power, his majesty, and all the problems and trials that we face, face in this world, even the potential death threats this world may throw at us, are all put into proper perspective. The worshiper enters a divine presence and is enraptured with the beauty of holiness, and this world fades. There's nothing else that can separate us from the love of Christ. So let's close by turning to Romans 8. Look at Romans 8 very, very quickly here. Romans 8, beginning in verse 31, puts it in words that are just unmatched. Romans 8, 31 states, What shall we say then to these things? And Paul was talking about persecution. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that we, like Peter and John, may boldly proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might do what you call us to do, for Christians engaged in health ministry, that they would do health ministry in spite of the threats of wicked authorities that say you can't do that, that healing is a crime. Father, we pray for the holy boldness that they had in their day. We need it, Father, in our day, as persecution increases and ramps up. We ask that we might serve you in this world in a way that's pleasing in your sight. Name of your blessed Son, our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.